Welcome everybody to NEMO's Digital European Museum Conference. We are starting now with the panel complexity, comprehensibility and credibility. But before we start, I would like to give you a quick introduction to our netiquette, a short uh, technical overview. Uh, I'm Julia Pagel, I'm the Secretary General of NEMO, and I'm very happy to introduce this panel to you. Um, just a quick run through the technical uh, issues. Your camera will always be turned out uh, off. Your, uh, the panelists are visible. During the Q&A, we ask you to please write your questions in the chat. You can also get our, our attention by raising uh, your hand virtually. The conference presentation and the Q&As are going to be recorded and we'll publish them after the conference. If you have um, any uh, questions, we will collect uh, your questions and uh, the colleague will deliver them to Alexandra, which I, who I would like to give the floor to now, the moderator of our session, Alexandra Bunia, who is Professor of Museology at the University of the Aegean in Greece. She's also Secretary of the Board of the International Committee uh, of ICOM on Contemporary Collecting. Alexandra, over to you. Thank you very much, Julia. Thank you very much, uh, Nemo. It's a great pleasure and a great honor for me to be here today and to uh, moderate uh, this uh, session. Uh, we have two amazing speakers and we're going to have a very interesting discussion at the end of it, I'm sure. Um, what I'm going to do today is that I'm going to uh, give a very brief presentation. I promise it will be very brief. And then I'm going to introduce uh, our two wonderful speakers uh, and I uh, give the floor to them. Uh, please um, write your questions uh, after uh, the presentations. We are going to have uh, um, um, a Q&A session uh, and I'm sure that uh, we will have the opportunity to um, have some really wonderful questions and some really wonderful answers. So um, let me um, just um, uh, start uh, with uh, a very, very brief, as I promised, uh, introduction. I will start the session today by uh, sharing the obvious. We live in a highly complex world when comprehension of what is happening around us is getting harder and harder every day and credibility seems to be much in demand in the public sphere in general. The challenges around us, around our societies are numerous. We communicate with each other today through a screen as a pandemic has put the whole planet on an unseen before lockdown of one type or another at one point or another during the last eight months. We experience already the outcomes of global warming and climate change. And negotiating the past is as challenging as ever at a time when post-colonialism searches in vain for global justice and culture wars are raging in some cases in newspaper headlines and social media accounts, in others inside churches, synagogues, mosques and schools, or even in the middle of public squares. People need to fight every day, literally or metaphorically, to make sense of the world around them to understand who they are and to defend their rights to live the way they want and to speak their truths regardless of what others think. Have I become political? I think I have, but I also think that this is what museums have become as well, or this is what museums need to become as their role is shifting and being redefined amidst all the challenges that I just referred to. My argument based in principle on the complexity theory is not one that is concerned with simply identifying that there is a lot of stuff happening out there and museums need to deal with them. I want to argue that as museum professionals and academics, we need to start thinking in more complex ways about how social institutions, are, as museums are, need to redefine their roles, taking into account that they do not operate in isolation from the entirety of the expectations and demands that they are confronted by. The role of museums, their shifting functions, their political or neutral agendas, their external versus internal priorities, exogenous versus endogenous pressures, are being debated in the museum world for a few years now. I think that this debate became even more intense and in public since the summer of 2019, when a new definition of the museum was offered by ICOM Special Committee. Numerous lengthy discussions, heated debates, conferences, workshops, and roundtable discussions have not managed to bridge the gap that apparently exists between those who support the primacy of the internal needs versus those who believe in the urgency of the external ones. However, is this a real binary? 
In my view, it is not. Museums are complex institutions inextricably connected to their societies. They cannot be defined or understood without them and outside them. Their internal functions are therefore deeply interconnected with all the challenges the world is currently facing. Societal inequalities, asymmetries of power, an alarming environmental crisis, threats to humanitarian values and democracy at large. Museums and cultural institutions in general need to develop different strategies that will enable them to tackle complexity, support people's understanding of what is happening around them and retain their role as credible sources of learning. This is an ethical responsibility, but also an important element of sustainability. Museums are sites of public consciousness. They are part of the dynamics of cultural change that intersect with both formal and informal spheres of political action. They have an ethical obligation to contribute to social justice issues, extend government policy priorities, and protest against human rights abuses. They need to confront challenges and translate them for their communities keeping them at the core of their work, being attentive to their community's needs without being afraid of becoming political educators on their behalf. They're not neutral or safe spaces in the traditional use of the terms, but places where the past, the present and the future are constantly negotiated and renegotiated. They have to be brave spaces. The papers that will be presented in this session will focus on two different strategies museums can use in order to tackle complexity, support comprehension and retain credibility. Storytelling as heritage interpretation and the use of method driven approaches for the reconfiguration of the notion of content and participation in museums. We have two great speakers today with us. Dragana Lucia Radkovic Eidemir uh, lives and works uh, in Zagreb, Asia, but also in Istanbul and Chesme in Turkey. Uh, Dragana Lucia I took her professional steps in the Ministry of Culture. In 2005, she jumped into adventurous entrepreneurial waters and founded a small niche company that connects culture and tourism. In Muse, Muses, as is the company's name, she works with her team mainly in the field of heritage interpretation, museology, heritage management and sustainable cultural tourism. Receiving and sharing knowledge is your greatest passion. Working with local communities that gather to celebrate their heritage is her calling. Uh, Lucia uh, is proud uh, of uh, her European Diploma in Cultural Management uh, that she acquired in Brussels by the Marcel Hichter Foundation ESCO Fellowship in Poland. She dedicates her free time to her volunteer work with European NGOs and she's delighted to be a member of the Supervisory Board of Interpret Europe and the president of Interpret Croatia. Our second great speaker is David Vineyard. Uh, David is a futurologist, design thinker, game developer, and the head of education and participation at the Futurium in Berlin. As a trainer and moderator of future science, he has assisted in numerous innovation and strategy processes. David has a passion for the development of new learning and interaction formats. In his work, he aims to make complex issues understandable, inspire people to tackle future challenges, and create new forms of public debate. Let me give the floor uh, to Dragana Lucia for uh, the first uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. Let me just share my presentation. Uh, thank you a lot, Alexandra, for your introduction. And thank you, Nemo, for inviting me and giving me a chance to share uh, and give my share in uh, Museums Making Sense Conference, especially tackling the theme of complexity, comprehensibility, and credibility. And thank you, Rieka. Uh, I hope we will all have the opportunity to cherish the work of the great team of the European Capital of Culture, Rieka 2020. Unfortunately, 2020, the year that challenged every single human being on this planet. I would like to start my presentation with a quote from a media psychologist and a social scientist, Pamela Rutledge. Stories are how we think. They are how we make meaning of life. Call them schemas, scripts, cognitive maps, mental models, metaphors, or narratives. Stories are how we explain how things work, 
how we make decisions, how we pursue others, how we understand our place in the world, how we create identities and define and teach social values. As a type of a non-formal learning, heritage interpretation helps people learn about heritage and its universal values. Telling meaningful stories makes important part of a good heritage interpretation. By understanding the universal values of heritage, people are more open and ready to understand and cherish the values of the so-called other. In this way, heritage may become a universal platform for creating an inclusive and democratic society from the bottom up. In the context of heritage interpretation, storytelling helps us to reveal the human story behind the heritage phenomenon, the museum object or a museum collection. The human story in the interpretation of heritage helps to overcome the complexity of many heritage phenomena. Not only the complexity of specialist knowledge that is inside of that phenomena, but also the complexity of the point of views, which was very well introduced by the Richard Sandals keynote speech. To look at the museums as places where human stories are collected and being told brings other dimension to our work. People visit museums to hear relevant stories and also stories that have credibility, stories that share values, or vice versa. We create museums because we have stories that are important and relevant to be shared, that help us to connect to each other and the others, understand each better, and together give our share in building a more inclusive and tolerant society. Intangible heritage, especially after 2003 UNESCO Convention, certainly represents a paradigm shift for the whole heritage sector. Because unlike material or tangible heritage, in its safeguarding, we work less with tangible objects, but more with people who are the barriers. And by people, it's about all kinds of people. Here, the importance of listening to the human story behind the skill or practice of intangible cultural heritage becomes even more apparent. Human stories are the core, the heart of intangible cultural heritage. Let me introduce you to the UNESCO Intangible Cultural Heritage of Pecharac. It is the key to the identity of the people of Slavonia, a region in Croatia, but also to neighboring countries like even Hungary, Serbia, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. It is a song accompanied by the orchestra composed of two lines in a decasyllabic couplet form. Its form is the only strict part, firmly set part, but everything else is arbitrary. The range of topics or themes that this little song tells uh, about, sings about, are endless. The word becharas derives from the Turkish word beker, meaning bachelor. And the songs uh, are sang about the various life situations of a young seducer or a bachelor, but also of the lady. So we don't have only a male singer, but we have also the woman singer. They are thinking about every kind of situations, uh, life situations, including their family relations, money, political matters, sexual adventures and ventures, all kinds of stuff. It is brutally honest, it is full of life, it is accurate, and it is direct. Some of the qualities of Becharat's heritage are the absence of self-censorship and the vitality of this haiku type micro form to express all the challenges of human being a human. I always like to stress its cathartic therapeutic role as well, because somehow it helps uh, to, uh, as, as a subtle tool to a kind of social control and order. 
Becharat is unavoidable at various social gatherings that follow human life from birth to death. It is performed throughout the year following agricultural work and religious festivals in traditional setting. But today, Becharat is spread everywhere through social media, through YouTube channels. So Becharat is actually also present in a contemporary ways of communication. Few of the becharats that I uh, found out are actually tackling the ac accurate COVID situation. Um, as you can see on a slide, the composition is really very simple. It is two lines of verse, it's decasyllabic uh, and at the same uh, uh, time uh, joined by rhyme, so it forms a very strict uh, rule. This one is, is Duchana napuni sanduke nebrini se samo peri ruke. Neće žena da mi pruži ruku, samo noge na mekom jastuku. These are the examples. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not really able to sing them, but they have always the music behind in the choir and uh, mandali, type of mandalina stamburica. Um, usually at the beginning of the performance of that type of songs, the themes are more being uh, benign in general, but uh, as the socializing of people continues, Regardless of schedule uh, and environment, the themes become more provocative, more direct, and usually a duel develops between the performers. Sometimes the meanings are obvious, but sometimes they are hidden. By then, when this all gathering really starts to, to um, let's say, vibrate, vibrate in the same pulse, everybody is already immersed in it and actually had some kind of um, initiation. Various topics are not always pleasant to hear, not in line with the moral norms of communities that are in principle patriarchal and would be easily put in a drawer as conservative. So this short story I just shared with you about, uh, you, uh, with you about this heritage of Becharats actually takes us to the town of Kleternica the main development goal of this community is the establishment of the Becharats Museum. This small town, one of many of its kind in Europe, uh, with its surroundings has about 11,300 inhabitants only, and is located in the region of Slavonia in Eastern Croatia. Although small, Pleternica is one of the most successful local governments in terms of withdrawing EU funds in Croatia. After Becharats was included on the UNESCO list of intangible cultural heritage in 2011, this municipality decided in 2014 to protect the copyright to the Becharats Museum and set its establishment as one of the main development goals for the years to come. For them, the museum is the right umbrella to collect and share their stories. For us, as heritage interpreters and museologists, listening and sharing stories was the main tool in Becharat's museum interpretation planning process. The format of participatory works or workshops helped us gather together key st stakeholders and the barriers of the Becharat's living heritage. Through semi-structured and open-ended interviews with people from the local community, we have established a close connection. Working in groups, people share their experiences, opinions, attitudes, and stories. We facilitated the process and also shared our experiences with an emphasis on presenting our previous work with other communities so that we open that kind of exchange process. It was important at the very beginning uh, of our work with this community to establish a partnership with the main stakeholders and in order to get a mandate and trust from them to continue work together on their community museum project. Some workshops con uh, conceived through the technique of mental math, which um, are completed by participants working together in small groups. They created maps of heritage narratives and interpretive themes. For us, they represented an important starting point and a kind of a database on which we have developed next phases of the museum development. The mapping process is always accompanied by very engaged discussions and opinions sharing. 
And what creates a special atmosphere during such meetings is the fact that the participants do not talk about some heritage and what they have learned about it, but they tell stories about their own experience of living their heritage. On a later stage of the interpretation planning, a questionnaire was created that contained questions related to individual thematic units, units or museum exhibits. We asked questions such as, would you be involved in the development of this exhibit as a storyteller or in some other way, or should the storytellers be from Fraternica or elsewhere? To this last question, as many as 97% of the workshop participants answered that the storytellers should be from all over Slavonia region and elsewhere and not exclusively from their own town. Every gallery of the museum permanent exhibition has one strong theme. The theme of the welcoming gallery is Becharats, it is us. You see here on the render the videos of the museum storytellers, the members of the community sharing their authentic stories about how they were initiated in the world of Becharats. Sorry about the joke, the photos of Dustin Hoffman and Bob De Niro are here just uh, as an example for visualization purposes of the uh, rendering of the, of the future gallery, but I'm sure that they would also perfectly fit into the Becharats community. One of the exhibits in the Welcome Gallery is dedicated to an important form of Becharats, which is a duel. Namely, the performance of Becharats is often one of improvisation in word jesting between two lead singers. The lead singer, backed by his own or her own choir and orchestra, playfully responds to the provocation of the rival with the intention of defeating them or him or she with wit and speed of changing themes, which will make it difficult for the other side to upgrade and outwit the challenger. This interactive multimedia exhibit in a future museum gives the possibility for a visitor to witness the duel with the performers that take turns. A woman to woman, a woman to a man, a man to a man. And this is also the moment visitor is initiated into the community of Becharats. He's somehow prepared to go forward. One of the highlights of the Museum of Becharats permanent exhibition is the unit where sexual, sexual songs are being interpreted. They are called greasy or masni becharzi. Here you see that we have designed a sort of protected space so that younger visitors are not exposed to explicit sexual content. We put 18 plus mark to communicate the age criteria for the visitor. When we were presenting the renders to the local community, majority of them voted for 16 plus. So we changed it. The phenomenon of sexually themed Becharat songs has a truly exceptional value. It was noticed and researched by a Croatian, Austrian, Jewish sexologist, ethnographer, folklorist, and Slavist Friedrich Salomon Krauss at the end of the 19th century. He was one of the first sexologists and was also a collaborator of Sigmund Freud. Sexuality in Becharat songs resists all taboos and in these sexually explicit haiku stories, the protagonists are all included. And those songs are sung by women as well as by men. Maybe it is not just a coincidence that Slavonia, except being abundant in Becharat's heritage, has also very strong rap scene in Croatia. Rap performance and Becharat's performance have a lot in common. Improvising a strong social dimension, avoiding any self-censorship, provoking established patterns of behavior, insightful viewing, and commenting on everyday life. Towards the end of the permanent exhibition, this exhibit puts the performances of Slavonian Becha and Reper in a sort of a competition, or better, a duel that is slightly different from the duel we've met at the beginning. This time, is an intergenre competition dual between tradition and contemporary performing forms. Who will win? The winner is actually not so important, but the stories and messages they transmit in their songs are. 
The final exhibit takes us into the future, several centuries in advance, and plays with a futuristic vision of the Becharats. Here, Becharats is performed by artificial intelligence. Our colleagues from the IT team designers were especially happy because programming this exhibit is a yummy treat for them. But question is, does Becharats and its stories merit if there is no people? If there is no one who will be inspired by the story, and if the story makes no connections between people, does the storytelling make sense at all? The same goes for heritage and museums. Do we all know the answer? And now I would like to return to the quote from the beginning of this presentation that ends with stories defined and teach social values. Inspired by the work of colleague Janet Blake, who highlighted the five values contained in, in intangible cultural heritage, I bring here five values that are worth keeping in mind when talking about heritage storytelling in the museums, community museums in particular, as a tool for museums making sense. First, human rights, including cultural rights and cultural diversity. Telling and hearing each other's stories, empathy and respect for the story of the other. Participation as a procedural instrument. Role of communities, empowering communities by the shared ownership of the museums. Living heritage, recreating values and asking questions one after the other. That means to be alive. Thanks a lot for listening to the, this story and I hope it triggered and inspired many of your own stories. Thank you very much, uh, Dragana Lucia. I think that it has inspired people because I can see uh, questions coming in. So uh, I'm looking forward um, to the discussion after that. Uh, let me uh, now give the floor uh, to David uh, for the second presentation. David, the floor is yours. <clears throat> yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Alexandra, for the introduction. Um, 15 minutes about complexity and museum is labs. That's uh, totally ambitious. Uh, I try my best uh, to give you probably some ideas um, how, how we work and how you can tackle this, this challenge. Um, I work for Futurium, um, which is a new founded um, exhibition space based in Berlin. Um, we opened September last year. Uh, right before Corona started happening, and uh, the idea of Futurium is to um, uh, to be a place where possible futures are presented, explored, tested, and discussed. And our aim is really to empower people to shape the future. And for that, we have three main spaces: the main exhibit in the upper floor, a forum, and a lab in the basement. Yeah, and the exhibit shows uh, different future scenarios and um, is. Yeah, based around um, different um, projects that are showing how we can shape the future. Um, in the uh, forum, we have a big hall where we can do panel discussions, workshops, uh, which we also rent out for science organizations, for example. And then um, we have the lab in the basement, which is uh, yeah, the space for exploring, tinkering, um, uh, having creative processes, we're showing different projects out of art and science, and uh, this is basically the Futurium in a nutshell. So the question for uh, today is museums as labs, how can this be possible? Because museums are normally associated with the past, showing what had happened, and labs are about the future and creating the future. So how can that be? Um, uh, probably a good way to start thinking about labs is to look at famous labs from the past. Uh, for example, the Bell, Bell Laboratories, uh, where they invented the uh, semiconductors, or the MIT Media Lab, which is, I don't know, probably the most um, sparkling place where, where new uh, ideas from interaction design to robotics are happening today. And another example um, is uh, probably IDEO, uh, because they invented this technique known as design thinking, which takes the process from designer into um, many processes, also uh, usability design, and which is uh, quite useful if you are in the uh, interaction or in the exhibit design world. So what are the ideas from labs? Um, they, they have some common, common ideas, for example, um, 
uh, they encourage creative thinking, uh, encourage people to have original ideas, sharing, open culture, uh, provoking spillovers. These are all um, criteria, criteria that make uh, make labs what they are. And um, yeah, the, to to how to say uh, how to to facilitate this this creative process. And yeah, one very basic idea from this labs, and this is um, a bit the theme for me today is uh, they're creating complexity so they um, open up new things and then they have a very um, refined decision process um, so they open open the idea space up and then closing it by um, enforcing decisions yeah and uh, how this can work also in a cultural uh, museum context uh, therefore i want to change uh, exchange some ideas with you um, and the first thing i think you need to uh, to go into this this process is to have a certain mindset and uh, the mindset of Futurium is of course a little bit uh, focused on on future and future thinking but uh, future thinking is also a very important skill for labs in general because it's always about the future and always about exploring new things but I think uh, this is very useful for all of you who are thinking about establishing a lab or a components in, in museum. And the first um, very important idea uh, is that the future is um, not fixed. It's basically open. So you can imagine it as a, a conus, uh, like, like a lamp. As a, a, if you project um, it on the wall, the, the circle gets bigger uh, every time you, you move a, st a step backward. And in um, future science, you normally say you can make progress prognostics about the next two or three years, but then you're getting over to educated guests and then for the longer time spectrum, you are, you are in the field of um, speculation. And this means one important thing for us. Um, it means that we, when we talk about future, we're not talking about possible or probable futures, but mostly about preferable futures. So we're thinking about a future we want to live in or a future that is good for the planet, because we know um, we can't make a prediction. And if we do make predictions, um, we're getting into mind territory and probably the next uh, next important thing we work with at Futurium is um, then for the decision making process uh, to to think what uh, uh, has um, the future or a vision or something like that for consequences for us so the first level is like the me level um, what is important for me uh, how do I want to live and um, for example if you want to have a jet set lifestyle and want to go um, around the world have different houses this is fine if you if you want it for you um, uh, but uh, then if you look at the next level the foundation for the media society uh, you you see that uh, this couldn't be a solution for everybody because then we're asking the question what is good for the community and what is uh, benefiting the society and then we have to think about other solutions if we think about the society at, um, uh, at its um, uh, Felicity. And then on the ground floor, like the, the uh, fundament for everything is the system Earth. And um, if we're thinking about solutions about the future, we all always have to think about what are the planetary boundaries and what do other creatures need. And this framework um, is for us very important as a basic mindset to thinking about the future and finding solutions for the future. Um, then another tool we're using are the SDGs, just because um, these are like common future goals and um, uh, they help us to get orientated. Yeah, a last very important um, mindset for thinking about the future are future strategies. These are some best-selling books from the past about the future and they represent very different strat strategies how to tackle future problems. and. Um, one can be summarized as um, a book full of high-tech strategies, which is basically about robotic AI and stuff like that. Um, then the book from Tim Jackson, Prospect, uh, uh, Prosperity Without Growth, is um, thinking about degrowth strategies, something very different, um, uh, which is basically saying less is more. And then another principle, for example, is based on the principles of nature, um, cradle to cradle. Um, why do I tell you that? Um, I tell you that because uh, for for one problem there are different solutions always and we have to make up a thinking space 
where we are aware of these different solutions and um, enable people to find uh, their own strategy. And uh, we also do that in our exhibition. We have three thinking spaces um, where we show different projects and they all are quite different. And um, the visitor can choose different solutions for, um, for future problems like climate change and he can, the visitor can collect the solutions. So at the end, uh, he has like a basket um, with ideas um, he can take home. And uh, this is interesting because we're not presenting a, a, a solution for the future, but we're presenting the complexity and then giving a space where the visitors can find their own path and their own sin. Inspiration. Another very important thing for labs, but also for creative museums. And um, if you imagine the future, um, what does it look like? Um, and when we ask people in, in our workshops, they mostly uh, tell us something like this. Oh, the future will be like a big metropolitan area with greenscapers and with a new transport system and re, um, renewable energy. And um, this, this pictures us mostly stereotypes. Um, it's not the future that people want or um, people, the people want to live in or which is sustainable or something like that. It's, it's just a stereotype took from the media. And um, these are like the pictures from today, from our future. I don't know, um, touch displays, uh, autonomous driving, stuff like that. Um, and we take that for granted that the future will be something like that. But if you look at the past, like past pictures of the future, you see um, that this uh, doesn't have to be true always. Um, you probably know uh, comics or movies made from the 50s and 60s where people were imagining a space age and flying cars and stuff like that. And this looks rather funny for us today, but uh, back then this was uh, that serious. Um, people believed in that. And so if we're thinking about innovation and new stuff, um, we have to get rid of this stereotype uh, pictures. And uh, we want that at Futurium too. We want people to think and therefore we give them examples uh, that are out of out of the cliches uh, to provoking thought how to say so to say um, this happens in the lab mostly um, where we show projects about uh, about the future and uh, I have I think I have a problem with my audio so I don't show you the the video but I can give you the link to the video later um, uh, because we uh, have uh, um, I tell tell you now about this this project. Um, this uh, installation you see here is one from Philip Beasley. Um, he's an architect based in Canada, and he works about thinking systems. And this uh, sculpture you see in the uh, foreground uh, is uh, is thought as a um, prototype for the architecture of the future, uh, an architecture that is more like a living forest or a living organ organism, and it's packed full with technology and with um, uh, forms inspired by bone structures of birds and stuff like that. And uh, this is like an ongoing project we can then also uh, um, uh, use in our workshop space um, and reprint some stuff on laser cutters and uh, 3D printers and stuff like that. Um, another project uh, you can see on this picture is quite interesting because it combines tradition with future. Um, it's a 3D printer and it's working with clay. And as you probably know, clay and building with clay has a very long tradition. It's used in, since three, four thousand of years uh, to building homes. And what is interesting is to, to combine something traditional and something old with a high-tech solution uh, can bring up new solutions and new, new ideas. And we're doing that all the time uh, in, in our space so that we are giving the people visiting us a, a, a design idea, a, a design principle, and they then can use that uh, to go. The next step. So this is the video that is not working, um, where I give you the link after the presentation. Last important thing, collaboration. Um, we actually built at Futurium our own tool set to um, enable people to collaborate, to think together about the future and be creative together. And to give you an idea how a workshop with this materials work, I prepared some videos and um, they are with, without sound, so I can just talk over them. And um, 
in this process with the uh, uh, with the uh, I, I will show you we also incorporated this principle the principle of creating complexity and then making decisions so first step in the process is creating different future scenarios and uh, for that we uh, use uh, this uh, card set and, and and on every card is a future trend for example if you're thinking about the future of cities one trend would be where do we live in the desert under the earth on the mars um another trend category would be how does the transportation system look like and you can com combine these trends and um, create out of 20 or 40 trends like millions millions of, um, uh, of possible futures and then in the second step the group has to decide in which future do we want to live which combination is uh, is a desirable vision and therefore they're selecting trends uh, they're thinking um, oh, this would be a, a good future we want to live in, and then um, discuss them and create out of that, out of that uh, a, a common future uh, vision. And um, you see it's, it's an analog workshop. Um, actually, we miss it quite a bit in Corona times because for, for creative processes like that, it's so important to, to be together and discuss. So third, third step is now expanding the vision, so coming up with more ideas, so creating more complexity. And uh, for that, uh, we draw, draw pictures of the future. So we try to prototype a little bit and uh, the workshop participants uh, really go wild and then also share by, their idea with other people. So um, after this phase, you really have a basket full of ideas um, concerning the future and um, con concerning how to to tackle future challenges and then the last step is really condensing all the ideas uh, that you have to one prototype and um, we love to work with prototype um, especially as a museum because you can exhibit them and uh, actually the the art pieces we show in the lab are nothing more than very well made prototypes for future solutions um, And as you can see um, in this workshop, for example, there were experts, pr professors, um, researchers who worked together with, with children. So this whole prototyping and building something with your own hands method is not um, it's not just something for school workshops. It's actually something we also use to to design and iterate our own exhibition. So it's for everybody. Okay, these are the future boxes, and this was actually my my last example so thank you very much um i hope it was not so uh, so confusing uh, just as a little side note my daughter was born this night as I, i'm still a little bit uh, um sleepover um uh, so thank you very much for your attention and hopefully it was not too confused um, and you could take something away for yourself thank you Thank you very much. Congratulations. Uh, that's uh, that's a very bright uh, message for the future. A, a newborn baby. I think that this is <laughs> the best message for the future. Uh, thank you very much for a very inspiring talk as well. Um, uh, yes, I mean, there are many messages coming in. Uh, congratulations uh, by many uh, participants. Uh, yeah, uh, many messages coming in. Um, Let's uh, uh, go to the discussions. We have uh, approximately 15 minutes for our discussions. I have some questions myself, but I think that I will not take advantage of my role, at least not for the moment. I I'm going to start with questions from, um, from the audience. So um, I will start with the first question, uh, which is addressed to Dragana. Uh, the question is, how much more complex has it become for museums to work with traditions from communities or historic aspects after the Balkan conflict in the 90s? Have museums acted as bridges between the neighbors in conflict? 
I think so. I think so. There is still a lot of potential, but I think so. And I think that um, just, for example, this museum that I was presenting is not yet finished. So this is still in the process, but uh, they are uh, very much counting on European projects that will help them also to merge together with the other communities that are sharing the same type of heritage or the same. Because I think that intangible heritage is a really great platform for communities to um, to really have direct uh, experience of each other. It has a really tremendous, especially when it's performing arts, when it's singing, when it's dancing, that has a fantastic uh, possibility. And I think that uh, already many of museums are doing that. For this, this one will for sure. This is great. Thank you very much. Shall I go to David with a question from the audience again? David, um, how is the museum supported financially? Is this a kind of research hub um, that is research groups from universities or other institutions that are invited by Futurium in order to execute pilots there or work for uh, projects there? Um, we have a mixed financing. So um, main financing comes from um, uh, the government. <clears throat> and then we have partners from uh, from science and from, uh, from the, uh, how to say, uh, uh, we have private and um, scientific partners. Um, so we have 15 partners from Futurium. The big science organization in Germany, like Fraunhofer, Max Planck, uh, probably known internationally, they are partner from Futurium. And they support support us with uh, uh, ideas, but also with, uh, with uh, financing. We are not, not a, a research hub. Um, so our main function is really science uh, communication. So we take ideas coming from science organizations and curating them in a meaningful way to present them to our audience. And uh, I think that's that's important. Uh, we don't do research ourselves. Um, uh, for us, it's uh, it's more it's more important to be this forum, this place where people can uh, can come and then discuss discuss uh, the future, especially people from from different spheres. Um, uh, I don't know Fridays for Future together with. Um, uh, people from a science organization, uh, science organization together with uh, people coming from a um, high-tech startup. And this discussion then happened at Futurium. Right. Thank you. Um, how does Futurium decide uh, about the themes um, uh, that it would use in order to create exhibits uh, and scenario? Uh, this is a very good <laughs> question because it's still uh, a work in progress. Um, for the first exhibit, I mean, we, we opened last year, so uh, uh, for the first exhibit, we just uh, uh, took um, five topics uh, that uh, were kind of relevant uh, in the last years, like the future of cities, the future of health, the future of uh, the economy, and uh, then took these topics to, uh, to tell, like, the, the main story we want to tell about the, the future's open, and there are many many solutions uh, for, for problems and we have to tackle these great challenges like climate change and the, um, uh, I don't know, uh, the, uh, the, uh, yeah, the, the big problems of the world. And we, we can't, we can't, uh, we can't just sit there and, uh, and look and uh, hope that something will happen, but we have to get active and do something. And uh, yeah, this, this idea of enabling people, this was, the most important part when we did like the, the, the first iteration of, of Futurium. And uh, topics are important, but not so important like as, as this enabling factor and the whole exhibition design and workshop design and edu education design behind that. And now, um, yeah, we're building like a more complex process where we try to involve different stakeholders to decide which will be the next topic for the, for the following year, because we want to change every year one topic um, out of Futurium. So the exhibit and the lab uh, continues involving and uh, be up to date. Thank you very much. I think this um, enabling of people and involving stakeholders is something um, that uh, um, came up uh, a lot in the, uh, in the presentation by Dragana, right? Uh, may I just uh, take this opportunity to turn to you, Dragana, and, and ask one of my questions. Um, I was thinking when you were talking about the communities and how you talk to the communities, uh, 
what is happening with the conflicting narratives as communities are not a homogenous body with a single voice in projects like the ones that you um, presented to us um, how can the museum accommodate these multiple and conflicting voices i guess conflicting voices is everybody's a story to be included in the museum and and how is this done um, you know, it's because I usually work with the small communities and I think everywhere around the world, small communities are more homogeneous communities. They are, you know, there are less people, they, let's say that there are less uh, young people, there are uh, also the, the, the type of inhabitants of the smaller provincial uh, communities is a little bit different than in the big cities, in the big center, urban centers. Um, but uh, in this concrete, and it, it, it really is different in every community also, the, also the uh, heritage material, the substance, heritage substance is where we come from. You know, not every heritage sub substance is enough, uh, let's say provocative for certain kind of issues like uh, you are uh, asking in your questions. But for sure, Becharac is one of them. Because as I, under as I explained, uh, uh, this heritage is really, Really tackling um, is really tackling every kind of controversy that you can imagine. Uh, uh, it's it's really and when I say that it's really it's really something that I, I of course I, I participated in many gatherings uh, when these uh, performances took place and I can say that sometimes it was really hard for me to uh, stay because th there is everything is uh, absolutely allowed. That, that also means in changing, uh, changing the, the, the things, changing the shoes. That is part of that kind of a heritage. So absolutely it is uh, tackling the issues of the man and woman relation, position of a woman, um, uh, LGBT community and the reaction to them. So because they are commenting through these uh, two verses, everything was going on in the world around themselves. Of course, optics changes. Sometimes you would say, wow, I, I share this opinion but of this verse. But then some other verse would come up and you will say, oh, no, 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 no. But the thing is that actually, uh, whenever I think about intangible cultural heritage, and we must be aware that there are many practices that are not in line with human rights. And they are traditions, you know, so this is the question, what, what is, what do we allow from intangible heritage and what we, what, what is the aspect, where, where, where do we say it's a heritage, okay, we will present, and where is this thin line, uh, what is not really that we, let's say, say, uh, support as a heritage. And I think I was very, uh, very, um, strict about that it's human uh, rights that are primarily criteria because if the heritage is somehow uh, stopping other other being human right then i think we don't talk about heritage thank you can i um uh can i uh, continue with another question to you dragona in the absence of stories people will make their own stories with very old sites, for example, Neolithic, when no stories are documented, how important is it to provide a story for the community? Oh, it is very important. Because actually, when, when, uh, when the story, when the heritage is more complex, um, our relation to it is important. This is what, what you know, what, how we relate to, to, the, uh, to the heritage from, from far away times is very important. What it means to us today, even if it's not based on facts, it's more based on, uh, uh, on factualities, but it's more based about what we see in it. What is the message? that this heritage is actually telling us. And this me message, according to my understanding and, and practice, is always, uh, always works when we deal with um, uh, human values, values that we share. So even in that kind, you know, understanding this kind of heritage through the human experience, I think that's the, the most valuable part of uh, uh, working in a heritage sector. Thank you very much, Dragana. 
Can I uh, go back to David? David, uh, does the museum, Futurium, learn from the ideas of the workshop participants and how? Are there um, results part of the organization development scheme? Uh, yes. Um, it depends a little bit on the part of the exhibit, but uh, in the development of the uh, Futurium, we did uh, uh, different workshops with uh, visitors. There's a German method called Zukunftswerkstatt, which could be translated as future workshop. And um, there you go through different phases. You um, identify current problems, then find uh, common visions and then uh, coming up with, with uh, solutions. So we really went into a co-design process with just normal people, but also experts. And in the lab, uh, it's a little bit more um, a little bit more broadened up. So every project you see down there is uh, actually a prototype. And this prototype can be changed over time. So people come in and work on a sculpture and change something. And uh, as you see, this clay printer, this can be used by visitors in, in workshops. And then we come up with, with new parts for the exhibits. And they are not just by the uh, project owner, but also by uh, normal people. Uh, we do also citizen science projects. Um, we um, have, for example, a collaboration with Sensebox, which is an open source weather station. And we built um, around 50 um, open source weather stations in Berlin. Uh, to uh, measure the microclimate of, of Berlin. And then with this, with this data, which is open, available for everybody, um, you can see where are um, hotspots for pollution or where is uh, the airflow not so good and where it has to be, um, where are places for change. And then we go with, uh, with uh, other visitors uh, to use this data and go then in a future visioning process to imagine the city of the future. Um, so it's an ongoing pro process and uh, for every pro project we uh, try to find new solutions for this co-design processes and uh, then develop methods uh, how to tackle them and which uh, what is very important everything is open source so our education materials for example are all open education resources so we enable other institutions to use the material and adapt them uh, to their needs um, and then getting their feedback uh, back uh, to to learn uh, more about it because we are no no experts in in all fields <laughs> it's actually impossible but there are other um, institutions who are experts in their field and can use our methods and uh, together we can learn a lot and um, that that's uh, that's uh, i think a lab principle that uh, uh, that works quite well if you if you open up uh, you getting uh, lots of ideas and uh, constructive feedback back, and uh, we use that use that quite a lot. Constant interaction with the audience. Then, um, can I ask you one more question? The COVID nineteen pandemic has accelerated the rate of change for society and museums, risking a huge disconnect. On the other hand, we will still uh, dead set to define the museum. Do you see a risk for future thinking here with a huge disconnect now possible even more? Um, so I'm I, basically I'm optimistic. I, I think um, it's not a huge risk for us, but we have to find proper tools to tackle this uh, this problem. Uh, the workshop, for example, was quite analog because uh, we think it's important to think with your hands and have an intimate uh, collaboration if you tackle complex problems and this is not possible over zoom um, and we exper experiment in quite a bit how to how to make li liquid learning formats uh, that are trying to combine uh, the analog and the digital in a covid 19 era and um, so one basic idea you can ta take from a game design um, so if you're buying a game you can take it out of the box and then play with your family and have a playful experience. And actually museums and cultural institutions can do quite the same, building like a little tool, toolbox, uh, sending to people and then they can do like their um, little uh, creative adventure and then using Zoom and other video tools uh, to share ideas and um, have like this discussion part. And this is something we did quite a lot after we learned that uh, a creative Zoom meeting uh, it can be quite boring if you if you do it over a, a long time. So we uh, give them like a challenge for home. I don't know. Find problems in your street. Uh, what are uh, the problems right now with uh, with the transportation system in your town? And then you can do it like your little exploring thing. Uh, share that then online. Um, 
and then building like a prototype with paper and pens and kitchen appliances uh, uh, at home and then sh sharing this uh, this uh, prototype uh, back online so you have this this liquid ex experience um, this helps but it's not the solution forever um, I think we have to still experiment and come up with new new ideas but stuff is happening so I'm optimistic thank you very much um, there is a, a question uh, and at the same time an offer for collaboration um, you are open to collaboration with other museums or organizations a small NGO from Bucharest has created an interactive exhibition for children named Utopica and the goal was to unveil the ideal worlds for the future from the children's perspective. So there might be a possibility for collaboration um, uh, there. Uh, we are running out of time, but I think that I would like uh, to address the, the last question uh, to both of you, uh, just as a, as a final, uh, as final word. Um, stories are what we think and also what we feel. If museums make sense, what is the relationship between sense and sensations in museums? Can sensations and emotions create sense and inspiration? How? And what is your experience in this direction? And I think that this is a question that goes to both of you and it will give both of you an opportunity for um, the last few words. Dragana, do you want to go first? Yes. Um, absolutely. Uh, I, I think that uh, uh, this aspect of emotion and inspiration is something uh, really very strong that uh, museums uh, have an, as opportunity to um, make change. And um, especially I, I, I love to see the Futurium uh, because it's already it's just open museum and the um, amount of creativity that is poured in every museum because I work from the scratches to the new museums like this museum of Becharat is just not in the final yet phase but I know that this creativity of so many people involved together with communities who are sharing their stories and we are somehow transmitting them to the visitors uh, I think that these kind of cre creative processes are really magical. And I think that it's uh, in every really museum that has that energy, people are inspired and they are uh, uh, open, let's say, to also give their share uh, in museum making sense. Thank you. David? Yes, um, emotions are extremely important, especially if you are in the field of the unknown unknowns. Um, so it, quite often it happens that, I don't know, we're talking about robotics and the response is not an intellectual one, it's an emotional one. Oh, I don't think this feels good, this future you're picturing there. And I have some problem. I can't tell you what it is, but I, but I have a feeling about that. And um, we have to take this uh, seriously as a starting point for a further examination and exploration. And um, the other thing is engagement. If you want to get active and do something and want to push people to, to be active, it's a very emotional process. Um, so smiling, having fun, um, uh, going through a collective experience is something really, really important. So. Enabling is not just giving a tool set and inspiration, it's, um, it's, a, it's an emotional process and uh, this, uh, this is very important. And that's also a reason we use so much uh, game design techniques and workshops and uh, positive uh, thinking, even if we're tackling very serious problems like, like climate change, um, uh, because uh, changing the future has to be fun and otherwise uh, Nobody would do it, in my opinion. Um, so emotions are important um, for finding out more about your vi visions of people and how they relate to certain topics. And then on the other hand, as a um, mechanism for engaging and enabling people tackling the future. Thank you very much. I think that we got many ideas um, uh, today. Emotions, enabling people, uh, agile thinking, playfulness. Um, uh, I think that are, are they're all uh, wonderful uh, ideas that we can take with us to our, our own projects and to our own museums. 
thank you very much, uh, both to the speakers and uh, to everybody for um, you know all your questions. I'm sorry that we couldn't answer to all the questions, but I'm sure that uh, David and Dragana will be happy to answer uh, some questions uh, afterwards uh, in writing as well. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm just giving the floor to Yulia again. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you, Dragana. Thank you, David, for this very inspiring session.